Welcome to the Mind Speaking Podcast, where we talk about the human side of data. In other words, data, communication, and personal development. My name is Gilbert Eikelboom. I'm driven by curiosity, and my aim is to spread insights that you can apply in your life starting today. So, let's do it. Let's start Mind Speaking. Have you ever been frustrated that people were not using your dashboard or your other data products? Then today's guest, Brian T. O'Neill, has something to tell you. He has a technical background, but has been a product designer for over 20 years. He's a consultant, speaker, trainer, working with companies all over the world, specifically data leaders, to help them leverage the principles from human-centered design. He's the host of the Experiencing Data podcast. And next to all of that, he is also a professional musician. So we talk about the human in the loop, how we can understand our end users and make a big impact with your data. So let's dive right in. I hope you enjoyed this episode about the human side of data with Brian T. O'Neill. Hi, Brian. Thanks for joining today. Hey, what's going on? Good to be here. Yeah, I'm really, uh, I'm really good, and I'm looking forward to this conversation today. I always like speaking to people who have a diverse background, who combine different fields of interest to see what they can learn from uh, each each area. Sure. And yeah, I'm looking forward to to dive in here. But to start, of course, I know you a little bit, uh, but my listeners also are interested in hearing from you about your background, what's your story. So can you tell us a bit about that, please? Oh sure. Uh, well, my I have a interesting story that has nothing to do with data or technology at all. So I'm actually, my training is as a musician and that's one of my other careers. So I'm a a classical and jazz percussionist and drummer. Uh, That's what my degree in school was in. And, and back in college, um, I was doing exposed to the internet through some guy in my dorm and kind of got me into that whole world. And, and long story short, picked up web design as a career uh, while I was in music school and eventually moved to the East Coast of the United States and uh, ended up working at startups and then in the enterprise space uh, while also having my music career. And you know, 20 years later, I've, I've been here uh, doing both of these things. And over time, uh, I was a product designer and user experience designer at ver- various uh, both enterprise companies, small software startups, a uh, range of companies. But I seem to get, keep getting drawn into these fairly technical domains uh, with companies doing work in the analytics or information design space, uh, a lot of uh, financial services, uh, and you know, I worked at Fidelity and J.P. Morgan Chase and E-Trade, and uh, a lot of stuff with early live streaming of uh, uh, charting technology for traders, stuff like that. Uh, and yeah, for some reason, those architects and engineers seem to like to work with me because I seem to kind of get them. <laughs> I understood that world and. Uh, got involved with data visualization. And anyhow, so I I decided to really consciously focus on that space about six years ago, since I my portfolio and and work and client base had kind of been in that space unintentionally, I decided to double down and say, you know, there seems to be a need for a different approach to making all this analytics and data useful to people. And data viz isn't quite enough and, and analyzing the data isn't quite enough and modeling it's not quite enough. The last mile is where a lot of these projects die. Uh, And so my focus is really on uh, helping companies that are using machine learning and analytics, particularly in software tools, applications, and what I broadly call data products to increase adoption of these tools in a meaningful way, largely by focusing on the humans in the loop, uh, looking at the user experience and, and remembering that as, you know, as I tell my audience, there's no such thing as a, as a business, like a business is just a collection of human beings. And so Ultimately, what user experience about is like making a change or an impact in someone's life that's going to be using some of this technology. And if we don't create a a meaningful change for the individuals that use this stuff, then we're really just in rehearsal. There's no concert. We're just rehearsing and practicing our chops of building models and building dashboards and building tooling and thinking that we're creating value because the paycheck usually rolls in unless you're a senior leader and then you've got probably a shorter timeline. So it's the outcome piece in the last mile, which is where uh, the rubber hits the road. This is, this is where projects either succeed or fail because you can't get the business value if you don't get through the adoption piece. So that's really my passion is trying to help people close that, that gap, particularly when building self-service 
uh, applications where there's not going to be a presenter there to take them through uh, what the data means and all of that. Instead, the idea is, oh, they're supposed to be able to use this application or tool to make better decisions, and we're not going to be there to tell them what to do. So how do we design that in a way that it's useful and usable, and ideally then they make decisions with it, and therefore the data actually drove some business value? So that's that's kind of the nutshell of my, my journey uh, in two minutes or so. Awesome. Yeah. And yeah. you do a lot of work in closing, closing that gap. And you mentioned that engineers uh, like working with you. And I think there are a lot of people that find it difficult to work with engineers or they struggle or especially if they're not in the, in on the engineer side, yeah. you say you kind of get them. Yeah. Um, what, what do you think is important for, for engineers <laughs> in collaborating with them? I, so I'm, I'm going to collectively I don't think I can stereotype quite enough between like the data crowd. And I've, I've kind of learned over the years, like I was talking to my buddy, Mark Madsen, who I, who's been on my show and, and works at Teradata. He's a, a distinguished engineer. One of these guys that get, basically gets paid to like go and think and find holes and to fill and problems to solve. And he's like, no, 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 no. The data world's really different than the software engineering world. Candidly, I haven't really seen that difference yet. And maybe some of you will argue that there's clearly a difference between kind of the mindset and the thinking. In my experience, I kind of see a, a very uh, analytical mindset, a very tends to be sort of black and white approach to thinking. A lot of times they don't understand the, the, the human piece super well as to why someone doesn't find something obviously easy to use or why would they not want to use this and the game they're playing is different. And so, you know, the, one of the examples I give all the time is, is this idea with like in data science, we talk about modeling and creating predictive models that technical accuracy is the thing that you're scored on in competitions and sometimes in school and you can write a paper about it. And in business, sometimes a 51% accurate is a home run because it's better than a coin toss. And, and since time started, the business made its decisions flipping a coin. And now they have a little bit of an edge. They got a 1% edge here that a little bit more of the time we're actually right if we trust this information. So that could be a big win. But letting go of the feeling that I put sloppy work out there, this model could be so much better. Letting go of some of that baggage, I think, can be, can be difficult. difficult. Um, and part of the reason, I think, too, that, um, and, and again, I'm, I'm really broadly generalizing here. I've met wonderful engineers with great uh, product sensibilities. And I've watched what I call the flip happens, which is when they've worked with designers enough and I start to hear the questions they're asking in meetings that have nothing to do with the architecture or how it's going to be built. And instead, how are we going to know if we did a good job? Like, do we really need to add that knob? Do we really need another filter here? Like, what if we took it out? They start thinking subtractively. They start asking what the tasks and scenarios are that users are going to use this technology with. They, they start changing the questions. And when I see that happen to me, I call that the flip. And it means they're no longer just thinking about building the code and getting the requirements down and, and kind of what I call the drive-through delivery McDonald's model of, of data projects, right? Like drive-through, two I'd like two dashboards and a side of French fries. And would you like that super size? Yes, please. And then on to the next Jira ticket. I have no idea where that driver is going with that food. I don't know if it tasted good. I have no idea. Not my problem. I'm just here to deliver the food through the window. And then the next car drives up. That's not the audience I'm talking to. And, and if you're happy doing that and you're, and you're successful doing that, that's fine. But if you're listening to the show and that works for you, great. You should probably hang up now because that's not the audience that, that I want to talk to to today with you. I want to talk to people who are, they know that the technical work is good. They probably have really good technical talent, but there's something missing in that last mile where they don't understand it. They don't trust it. They don't know how to use it or the status quo wins the game. Every day, the status quo continues to beat them no matter how much better the thing that they made is, or even sometimes we gave them exactly what they asked for and then they said, no, that's not what I meant, or they didn't use it at the end, or the data was too scary. And so they went another, they, they didn't really want to face the truth, all this kind of stuff. If you've got great tech talent and you realize that there's something in that, that human integration part that's missing, and sometimes it's called change management. And I, I, we can talk about that. I, I hate that 
that positioning as well as operationalization. That's another one of the words I can't stand. Designing these things, these ideas of change management and operationalization, that stuff from a design perspective, we would consider that part of the requirements. You design all of that into the solution from the beginning and you test this stuff along the way using prototyping methods, failing fast, increasing learning velocity. You don't do it at the end of the project. You don't slap the visualization on at the end. You don't think about the dashboard last. You think about the people at the end first, and then you work backwards from that. The people that want to get better at this, that's who I want to talk to today with you. Yeah, that's really awesome. It's a conversation I would love to have. Yeah. Uh, and I cannot stress enough how important this human piece is in, in data. Yeah. And you also mentioned the, the, the flip. So starting yeah. people starting changing the questions and looking more at the human side. Yeah. Well, what have you seen? What have you noticed? What have you seen that people helped make help making that flip? Or how have you seen a development in, in people? What do you think helped them to make that flip? Um, so candidly, I, I, the, I think the fastest way it happens is when they're exposed to working with designers and they've been exposed to the process of working with designers, the thinking that goes with it, when they start to see that it's not all about the ink part, the user interface part, the, the visual part that we tend to, we usually jump to data viz is what the first word that comes into mind when we think about design. So I think when that exposure has happened, that's a big part of it. Um, the, the place I usually like to try to start is to get empathy, get people exposed to this idea of empathy in the business context, which I think is sometimes a little bit foreign, but getting engineers and technical stakeholders exposed to real users actually trying to use these solutions in the wild. There's nothing better than that to create change. And it's the difference between looking at a study that said, you know, we surveyed 150, you know, finance operators and they said the dashboard was useful. Yeah, that's self-reported behavior. You don't know what to change with it. What like, okay, what if it was 79%? Like, what would you change? That that kind of feedback doesn't help us make any difference. But when we actually watch this salesperson or whoever this mark, let's let's use something like a marketing analyst whose job is to run ad campaigns and spend the money smartly, right? And, and we're building a dashboard that's supposed to tell them about their ad spend or something like this. Watching that person do their job using this tooling that we built for them that's supposed to help them, seeing where they fail. Individual human beings monitored by a team of makers. And I'm going to call all of you designers because there's no such thing as no design choice. So if you're putting out stuff into the world that other people are going to use, you are already a designer. You can't run from it because there's no nulls. No null no choices, right? So the, the game is really about getting better at design, not to become a professional designer to get paid at it, but to make sure that your data stuff actually gets used. That's what the game is. And that's what I'm trying to do is like just enough to get your great technical work used and relied upon. And so they say, Gilbert, that was effing awesome. Can you give me more? Can you help me with this? Now they're coming to you with more strategic stuff because they've seen the value of the work. And the way to get to that is to understand what's wrong with it. And by putting people, uh, observing people trying to use uh, our solutions, ideally at lower fidelity, earlier stages of the design, not at the end, not in Tableau with final data, not in Power BI, not in your app, way at the end when it's too late to do anything about the feedback we get, but earlier in the process. And when you see people struggling and saying, I don't know what this number means. I have no idea what a p-value is. Like, I just want to know, should I spend more than $5 per click? Like that's a, yes or no. Like, can this tell me? And you've shoveled pounds and pounds of evidence at them. No conclusion, no insight, just lots of evidence that they're supposed to then go make a decision about, should I spend $5 or not? I, like, that's my question here. And you see that friction about what they're trying to do. And then maybe you watch them mentally try to, uh, what we do what the mental math model, right? The eyeball analysis and they're flipping charts and downloading data and putting it into Excel. And, and you're scratching your head like, oh my God, the tool does all of this for them. And they're going back into their old habits because they can't figure out how to make sense of that information. That creates change because all of a sudden it's like your work has sort of just been judged. 
And it's not you that's being judged. It's the design that's being judged. And, and just like we're not testing the user, we're testing the design. And that feedback can be so clear. It's hard to argue with it when you when everybody's watching this person saying, I don't get it. And I just I probably would stop and just go back to the old way of doing it. It's really hard to argue with that kind of feedback. And it kind of stings a little bit the first time you get it. But over time, at least at least for me, I love this feedback because it it, it what it does is it's I'm learning something and it's telling me where I feel like this is really good, but I just, I want the confidence of seeing someone else get through it to, to, to learn something to say, yeah, that little model works that, that idea of that widget, like I didn't think they were going to understand what this index was. I was really concerned that the, the index would be this vague thing. They totally got it. That's a pattern. I could, maybe we can reuse that pattern. I just learned something about the world today, at least the world of my, my audience there. And so it's, it's kind of exciting. I kind of like it when my stuff fails because I like to be ex not feel so confident that, oh, I know what all the right design choices are because I'm a professional designer. It's the learning that, that I don't know, it just kicks off something for me. So I think that empathy, exposure to real people, both in the research phase, the prototyping phase, getting those people involved early and often is a great way to do this. And, and, and this can be difficult, like especially if you know the politics, the climate, the, the team may be looked at more as you know a servant. They're in a servant role where there's not a lot of credibility there and the business owners, like if we're talking about, and I'm talking about enterprise you know, context here, this can be hard because they, they, the, the strength it takes sometimes to ask probing questions and to have the time to go do this and like, why do you need to talk to me for an hour? And even to set up an interview when you don't even want to do it, like a lot of times, you know, the analytical types, they, they don't really want to go talk to a bunch of people and listen to their problems and all of this. Those people don't really, they're kind of like, is this worth my time? Like, I thought I already, I already wrote a requirements document. Like I already told you what the dashboard needs. Like, why do you need to talk to me? There's a lot of hurdles that you might have to cross to get to get this thing going. And I don't, I don't deny that that can be difficult, but if you want to keep playing yesterday's scrimmage over and over again, fine. But there's a reason as you, and I saw in your, your training, uh, I was looking at your training PDF and you had the, these stats about high failure rates in data science and analytics projects. And it's like, to me, it's like, yep, that's the Manchester United Spain game or whatever replaying all over again yesterday, again, 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 again. And if you keep repeating the way you do stuff yesterday, you're gonna get yesterday's results. So I'm saying for aspirational leaders who believe that creativity matters and that the human in the loop matters and that outcomes are what really matter in the business context, not outputs, not making the things, but making the change that comes as a result of the things that we made. If you're playing that game, that's who I wanna help because I don't know how to help the other people. I don't, I don't know how, how you keep creating outputs that nobody use and expect to get some new result. It's just not, you, you might get lucky occasionally, but you're, gonna, you're not gonna know what to recreate, right? So exactly. it's the outcomes yeah. that matter, not the outputs. Right, <clears throat> yeah, and I see a lot of frustrated people who, who say people are not using my work and my, my work is so good, look at yeah. the accuracy. Yeah. And I think it's a big, big problem in the market. And what you opt for is people getting better at design, right? And that makes me think, should we also uh, work together with designers in that process? Or should we do all the steps ourselves as a, as a, as a maker? Yeah. What yeah, do you think? Yeah. Well, a lot of teams don't, I, I think the journey depends on, you know, budget, appetite for change, culture, all these kinds of things. So a lot of teams designer, like, why would I have them on my data team? If you're starting with that, then at best, you're probably looking at getting training and trying to upskill your own team. Uh, other teams that maybe have some more exposure to, they're a little bit more digitally native, whatever that means, or they've, they have people that maybe have come from the software sphere. Having a designer on the team is just part of the, the three-legged stool of doing great, building great data products. You have Technical leadership, usually in software engineering, it could be a data scientist, but you have some kind of technical leadership, you have product management leadership, and you have design leadership. Those three things are the cornerstone of building great software data products. And the, I guess the weird thing for me, having come from that world, is how that's not normal 
in the enterprise data teams when they are building applications and tooling. And some of them think because they're using Power BI or Tableau or some kind of BI tool that, well, we're not really building software. We're, we're taking data and putting it into tools. And I'm like, the user doesn't care whether you hand built, they don't even know if Tableau is something you coded or it's a tool. They may not even know they're in Tableau. I don't know, they don't care, <laughs> right? It has nothing to do with it. So if you're building solutions that are on a screen that, that involve maybe online and offline things, like imagine a factory floor or some kind of service design thing where and decision making is just part of the step, but there's some real world decisions that get made that involve software or looking at screens. Well, you're doing software development. You effectively are. So you can copy the way Silicon Valley does it or the way mature software companies do this, or you can choose not to. And there's a reason why the early hires are in product management, engineering, and design. Most any kind of company that involves humans on the loop, and it's like, our customers are human beings and we need the, the users to understand how to use this stuff in order to value it. They usually have that skill set involved. So you can either hire for it or you can train for it. And I do think that non designers can, uh, people who are not professionally trained designers can learn this stuff. I've watched it happen. I've seen the change happen before. I've, and I'll tell you a little story. Uh, this is about Bill. Uh, he was in one of my recent cohorts and my training cohorts. And I'm not saying this to like pump up my trainer or anything, but this like made my day. And what he said to me was he, he's at a, a consulting firm. So they do analytics and data science consulting, largely in community health uh, in, in the United States. And all he told me was, you know, like my client, our clients already have noticed a change and they noticed the change in the questions that we're asking them. We didn't just jump to the solution at the end. We started asking them different kinds of questions and they literally thanked us. They thanked us for this because the session was so useful to them because they hadn't really articulated the answers to all these questions that we had. So we didn't have a shared understanding of what success meant. And it was a gift. It was not probing into business. It's not your business. Like I'm probing the hierarchy and you, your status is lower. So you shouldn't be challenging me and all this kind of stuff. No. It was a gift because it helped get clarity for everybody as to why are we here? What's the change we want to make here? Because you don't really want a model. That's not what you're paying for. And you're not paying for a dashboard and you're not paying for an app. Even though that's what's on the, the spec and maybe the salesperson said, we're going to build two of these and four of these and there'll be a model that tries to predict the following. That's not really what they wanted. They wanted the downstream outcome that they think is the promise of the app, of the tool, of the model. That's really what they're there for. That's what the value is. And if you don't do the proper probing and, and inquiry and really understand the problem space in a way that everybody can get shared understanding there, then you risk building yet another, as my one client called it, data widgets, more data widgets that may or may not get used, that may just go into the dashboard desert. And the next thing you know, there's 4,502 Tableau dashboards out there not getting used, no one knows what they're for. And as one of my past guests said, the first thing I do when I go to a new job is I shut them all down and I wait for the phone to ring to see which ones are getting used. We have no idea who's who made these things, what they're for, no idea. And I thought that was pretty yeah. genius actually. Like shut it down, you're gonna quickly find out what's mission critical, right? When the phone rings. Great, let's get rid of the fat. Start yeah, I think it's, <laughs> I think it's a really, really good. Of course, some people might might get angry, but also yeah. it saves so much time maintaining yeah. all those dashboards that are never used. And sure. I once I once read this is called a reverse pilot. So you don't introduce something to see if it works, but you take instead you take something out and see if everything yeah. collapses. Yeah. And usually, I think many uh, in many many cases people are not getting angry and people yeah. will not even notice. So yeah, yeah, I think many people can resonate resonate with uh, with these type of challenges. And yeah. I think it comes down to understanding, yeah, the, the challenges of the users and what are their dreams and fears and, yeah. and helping helping yeah. them realize those dreams. Yeah. And yeah. I think what, what many people think when people think about design, especially more analytical type of people, people working in data, of course, they think about data visualization uh, and with design, me, me too, I think about something pretty, um, but I think designing for analytics should be 
very functional, right? To be useful. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, what's your take? Is there any place for aesthetics in design for analytics? Oh, absolutely. And I think the the beauty of so one of the goals that before we try to get into anything with aesthetic beauty, even though I think aesthetics have a lot to do with why it's it's been actually studied that people are more willing to struggle with things that look good. This is actually well known because there's a perception that the quality is high and that, oh, maybe there's something wrong with me because this should be so easy. Like, I mean, look at an Apple product, like you just assume everything's going to be so easy. There's no instruction manual. And sometimes it's not easy. Sometimes a, a menu or a control is not in the right place, but the perception is, oh, this, this company spends all this time and money on design. It's probably just me and everyone else gets it. Like these stories that we tell ourselves. So the aesthetics do matter, but they're part they're just part of the, the layer cake of things that go into design. Data visualization is part of that. Interaction design is part of that. Usability is part of that. Utility, which is a little bit different than usability, is part of that. These are all different parts of the design cake, so to speak. And, and a lot of times what data teams are is they might be doing just one of those. They're doing the data viz part. And the problem with doing just the data viz part is that it presumes that at some point we've we've gotten all the data that we need. And then there's this visualization part that happens at the end. And the assumption there is that if we simply visualize the data set that has been provided to the, I'll call it the front end, then the work is done as long as we ap apply the right data visualization techniques. I don't see it that way. I, I see design as not, it doesn't end there. I see design as something that happens over time. It's a, a user experience, literally it's an experience. So it doesn't happen in one second, it's over. It happens over time. So we have to be thinking about where did people come from before they got to this tool? What are they doing in the tool? And what would make them depart either in a positive way or a negative way? Like they're going somewhere, they're doing something with this in theory, what's next? And sometimes there's an opportunity to connect our thing to what the, the next thing is to save that person some work, to save them some time, to help them make a better decision. Sometimes we can integrate these things instead of building like just another stop on the railway. I don't care what the next station is, not my problem. Yeah, that's an approach to doing things. It's not the design approach. We're thinking over time what happens in the entire experience. And, and that I want to shine a light on that and help teams think about that because no one just wakes up and says, I can't wait to just go look at the Tableau dashboard today. Nobody does that. There's a reason they check in. I'm worried about something. I'm worried I'm going to get yelled at if I don't make sure something is up and running or the status is correct. Um, someone's away and I'm supposed to take charge of this thing. And so I need to be monitoring this situation. I'm doing a budget forecasting and I need to forecast sales for the next whatever. I need to put the right prices into my sales quote. Whatever it is, there's a scenario that made someone wake up and say, I need to turn on Gilbert's solution right now and do something. And there's some success criteria for them. What would make them depart with a smile? How would we make their life better? These are not data visualization questions. Data viz is just part of that, and it's an important part, but you can completely visualize the data correctly and fail the game. You can lose the game even though you ran the play correctly. You can still lose the game. So I want us to be thinking about the whole game and not just executing one particular play properly because maybe the wrong data is there. We haven't connected the dots, but that was what was made available in the warehouse because someone made a decision downstream, probably based on the architecture or what was available or some other technical reason. That's what we have to work with. And so my thing is, no, we start at the end and we work backwards and we do our best with what we have. Yeah. And maybe that means we got to go fix some stuff. And I, I know all this stuff about dirty data and garbage in, garbage out. Fine. But let's go figure out what are the right holes to plug in this 70 year old company that has data from all over the, which the map coming in from all different sources. You could spend millions and millions of dollars trying to patch all that stuff, or you could figure out what would really make a difference today for Jane and marketing, right? Or John and marketing or whoever it is, what would make a difference there? Let's help them make better decisions and only fix those things that are necessary to do that. Because if we get a win on the board, they're going to call us again and say, dear Gilbert, can I have some more? Do you have some more help for me? Can you help us predict this? Can you help us do that? 
Now you're a strategic partner. Now you're helping them think differently. You, and you have the chance now also to say, hey, J Jane and John, what if we did it this way? Have you ever thought about projecting this number instead of manually running these calculations? Like we have a whole team of people who could probably give you a range of estimates for these price quotes that you're spending all this time on. They're going to be more willing to listen to a strategic recommendation like that because you put some wins on the board for them, not for you, but for them. But that only happens if that trust has been created. And that trust and that experience happens in that last mile on the screen. It's like, can I use it or not? Did it help me or not? Do I dread using this dashboard that the team made? Or do I find this like, I could not live without this thing. I would be shooting in the dark if I didn't have exactly. this. And I call yeah. that indispensable. Do you want to make it indispensable or do you want to just ship something? Screw yeah. safe, uh, safe, strategic, agile, frame, all this stuff about agile and all this stuff, fine. These are all engineering and project management methodologies. And so many of them still miss the mark about what does success look like and how will we measure that with the people who are going to use this stuff? You have to measure the scenario. You have to put people in front of stuff, run the scenarios with them, test the stuff and see if it works. And if it doesn't, you have to go back and change the design and you have to get better at that stuff. It doesn't matter if you're using waterfall or safe or all this, it doesn't matter. It really does not matter. If that part is not part of your success criteria, then all you're doing is you're just, you're, what I call rehearsing, you're just rehearsing and shipping stuff and you're measuring engineering and technical project management metrics, which are just proxy metrics, right? They're, they're progress metrics, but they're not success metrics. What did we ship? Oh, we shipped 18 things, four models, six dashboards, 22 applications and whatever. That's nice. Did any of them make a difference? It's really easy to count that stuff because the tools make it easy to count it. And it feels like winning because we're putting the people on the ground are doing a lot of work, writing code, looking at data, running SQL queries, doing all this kind of stuff. It feels like we're doing a lot, but sometimes we're not, we're not doing anything. I mean, 80% of the time, apparently we're not. I mean, these studies are actually getting worse. Like, I don't know if you watched them, but I just, you know, Tom Davenport just put out another study that was, you know, it's in the same solar system of, of studies like this. And it's like, it's getting worse. <laughs> <laughs> Even worse. Yeah. And I think, I think a lot of people without knowing, I think your metaphor in the beginning was, was spot on with, with the McDonald's. And I think a lot of people without knowing are, are behind the counter, you know, shipping, shipping yeah. burgers and being yeah. proud of the, the number of burgers they, yeah. yep. uh, they sell and, and deliver every, every week, but yeah. they don't really know what, what makes the difference yeah. for them. And I think a lot of people fail to build trust or at least build trust early because it takes so much time, some time, right. To build trust. It's not immediately that you win the trust if you ship something good and it all starts with, with the user. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I think it was very insightful. What I also would love to to talk about a little is your uh, the fact that you're a music musician because yeah. I think I believe that there's always so much to learn from different th fields and yeah. you're a decision uh, a musician you're an entrepreneur uh, you have your own company and you're a designer you're a, maybe also a data person so how what have you learned from music that you can apply in your work in data design or entrepreneurship. Uh, it's a great question. I think the probably the number one thing is getting com I'm comfortable with a high degree of risk. Uh, I'm comfortable putting stuff out into the world that's not going to work. I mean, I've done it with the current business I'm in. I'm trying to like right now I'm, I'm putting together this data product leadership community. I don't know the first thing about starting a community. I can go read what other people do. I get some advice from some other community leaders. I've asked my audience. I try to get feedback from them on what they like and don't like about these kinds of things. I have no idea what I'm doing, but I feel like there's an audience here that wants to connect with each other. So I will put it out and try it and see what happens. And if it doesn't work, well, what did I learn from that? And do I, is the timing wrong? Is the idea wrong? What's wrong with it? I'll learn something from that. And I'm, I'm comfortable putting that stuff out. And it's the same thing as an artist, especially when I'm doing, you know, my, my music work, kind of spreads from being a, a freelancer where I'm hired to come in, play with an orchestra, read the parts. There's some of my individuality that comes into that, but a lot of that work is very execution and precision oriented in that kind of space. Last night I played with a big band, a jazz big band, and that's there's a lot of interpretation that goes with that. And some of it might be good and some of it might not. 
and I don't know what's going to happen. Maybe I won't get called back to play with them again. That uncertainty and the and the risk and putting out records of, of my own material and shipping it and saying, "Dear world, here it is." And in that case, that that's a little different because we should probably tangent here talk about art versus design here for a second. As an artist, as a musician, I'm not trying to get followers and trying to get, I mean, yes, I would like to build my audience and I want my music to connect, but my goal is not to write, to, to compose music that I think people want to hear. My job is to compose the music that's in my head and hope that it finds the right people that say, hey, that spoke to me. It's not to try to change people into wanting it. It's an artistic expression and it's what Brian wants. That's also true for visual art. In my, in my opinion, the artist has a statement that it's the artist's statement. The artist matters. That's why the, the, the Leonardo da Vinci painting is worth so much more than the Brian O'Neill painting. And it could be look the same, but it, there's a different story with the Leonardo da Vinci painting because it's his, because he touched it, because of the story that goes with that. Design is completely not that. Design is all about the them. It's not about Leonardo. It's about the person it's for. This is the total difference here. And, and, and this is a problem with designers too, because a lot of them are also artists. And so early in the career, this is something we have to listen for when hiring designers is that we're not hiring artists. An artistic designer is fantastic, but we have to be careful that they're not there to try to put their, their primary goal is to put their mark on the company, their individual thing, because that's now about them. And it's like, that's fine, but that's the wrong game. That's that game you play at home in your own business, in your own time, doing your own thing. But here we're playing a different game and our game is about the them. And so everything I'm talking to, to, to your audience about, to, to the listeners here, it's about the them, not you and your team. It's about them. And it's a service mentality. And that's the, the heart of design is really about connecting with the them people and making it for them about making a difference that way. So we spend a lot of time as designers facilitating groups of people, getting them to think about the them and focus on those human beings because that's the path to the business value. So anyhow, that's my kind of riff on art versus design. And, and I guess what I've learned there, I guess the comfort with yeah. ambiguity. <laughs> yeah. And I love that. I love the two points that you're mentioning because when I was younger, I always thought about risk as in financial risk, right? Yeah. If, if you start your own company, you're not sure if it's going to work out if you sure. have a salary. But I think the intellectual intellectual risk is a much bigger component actually in, in entrepreneurship because you need to put yourself out there and do a presentation and not having enough content yet, but not sure if it's going to work out, sure. but do it anyways. And that's yeah. what you do as a as a musician as well. I was, yeah. I was wondering because I, I like to write. Uh, it's for business, but also personal, personal yeah. writing. Uh, and I put it out there. And often yeah. when I write something I thought about deeply, it doesn't resonate as much with my audience uh, yeah. compared to a more business like piece. Um, so sometimes I'm thinking, Hey, what should I write? You know, should I write the stuff that converts or should I write a piece that uh, is really more about me or expressing what is in my head? What are your mm -hmm. thoughts on, on that? When, when you look at writing, <laughs> I'm still learning this myself, but I, 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 and I know that you, you probably know a lot about habit forming. And so I, I got really sold on this idea of writing as a way to develop the expertise and getting good at writing happens as a result of writing. You, you don't premeditate it all. And then you write it down, which is kind of what I thought the process was. So you have to first become a bad writer before you become a good writer. So this is probably, ironically, the one habit that I've probably stuck with the longest. So I've been publishing since June of 2016. It's, 20, it's almost June now as we're recording this. So for six years, every two weeks, and I have not missed a single Tuesday. And last night it was 11.35 p.m. And I, I almost forgot to publish. And so if you got an email from my list about 11.35 on May 10th, that was because I could not... I, and I was still cooking. I was starting to cook my dinner. It was a long day. I stopped dinner. I turned the burners off and I went and wrote because that's this just I can't break the streak now. It's a habit. And over time, I, I, I'm hoping I'm getting better at writing. And I don't. And one of the challenges that maybe you have this too is that we don't always know if it's working. And this this is true with technology, too. We don't test all the users. We don't always know and they don't always tell us the negative feedback. 
it, it's hard to know. And then occasionally you get these anecdotes, you get responses from people. Someone says, I pass this along to someone on my team, or this really like clicked for me. And that's like the fuel that keeps me going. And so it's, you publish and it goes into the oblivion. You hope it makes a difference. And the best I know to do is, is to wait for those little signals there to tell you where to go next, to spend some time learning about how to become a better writer. One thing I'm trying to do more is twist the knife more in my writing and, and, and take more of a stand. And that's why I told the listeners on this audience, like, hang up now. If you want to do it this way, that's fine. That's a different game, though, than the one I want to talk about playing. And I mean game in the, in the fun spirit of we're sort of all spending our time playing this game. And I want to work with teams and leaders that think a different way, that they understand the game that I'm talking about here. It's okay if it's not for you. I'm talking to those them, the, the them over there, not the them over there, but these people over here. And I'm hoping to attract those people with my ideas and hope that they make a difference. And it might not. And totally candidly, Gilbert, I don't think a lot of data people give a SHIT about the work that I do. I think it's, it's like, it sounds vague and floaty and maybe a little hand wavy and, and it, it's like, fine. And that's okay. Cause it's not for you. But I think some other people have seen what happens when these giant initiatives die over utility and usability and customer complaints. And it all really comes down to like what they're interfacing with. They don't understand all the architecture and the plumbing and they don't know, oh my God, we migrated to the cloud and look at our, our IOPS and look at how fast the ETLs load and all this kind of technical stuff. They don't have any idea what that stuff means, but they do understand. I have a presentation due next week. The numbers don't make sense to me. I don't even know what this stuff means that you pulled together for me and I'm stressed out. I have a story to tell and does it tell the story that I thought it did or not? Because I need to be ready. Or I need to make a decision. We're, we're making a giant investment here. Should we or should we not? What does the data tell us? Can, can we automate this thing or not? Like, what's the risk if we do it? What's the risk if we don't do it? What do we not even know about this thing that we should know? Because I don't know what data science... I mean, you guys are like magicians to me. Help me understand what the risk is. That's... that When you understand that this human stuff really does matter at the end of the day, I think change can happen there. And so that's... That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm trying to write to. And it's a journey. It's, it's learning. I'm not a professional writer. I, I feel like we all have the imposter syndrome. I'm, so, I'm sure a lot of people working here maybe feel that way too. Even if you don't, if you're not self-employed like we are, and we're totally tangenting on this, but I think that imposter syndrome is real. But the best framing I've heard for that is when you're feeling that, it means you're bumping up the edge of the, un, up against the edge of the unknown. And you're, you're starting to push your comfort zone and what you you think that you know about the world. And it probably means you're now doing some real new work and it might not be meaningful and it might not matter, or it might be really important, but you're at least now starting to do something new and you're not playing yesterday's match again. And I, and so I try to jump into that, even though my, the lizard brain is kind of like phony and this is BS and this is going to work and blah, blah, blah. And the other, my, the other part of me is reminding myself, no, you're, 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 scratching at the door and you're pushing and you're pushing and that's the resistance and we have to Seth Godin calls this like dancing with the resistance you know and that's I, I really like that framing because it's a positive framing instead of a negative framing and I'm kind of just jumping into it because I'm like well I don't I don't have anything else to lose and I don't know <laughs> so that, uh, that's I, just part of the creative process you know yeah that's that that's great and I, I really like Seth Godin you that you bring him up because he He's a master at verbalizing that that feeling, right? Yes. That feeling of of yes. fear and unknown, and yeah. then dancing with it and going for it anyways. Yeah. And I think it's a fantastic habit to to build, and yeah. that more pe people should should experience and dare sure. to to do what they want to do. Yeah. Um. You you have a lot of things on your plate, right? You have your own company. You're a musician. You yeah. have a you have a child. You have a wife that plays in the same orchestra, I believe. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and how do you how do you balance all that? How do you combine it, or how do you make sure you're not getting burned out and stressed and anxious? What do you do? Um, to be honest, I, I so it's I'm not great at managing that. So I I have a fair fair amount of stress that I carry with me and the anxiety, I won't lie, the anxiety comes with me. I don't share that with my audience because that's not helpful to them. But I, I have that. I'm not going to lie about that. 
I would say the thing that probably helps me is systems. So uh, systems, automation of lo low, low importance tasks as much as I can, uh, having habits like, you know, when I publish, the podcast comes out this Tuesday, the next Tuesday I write. Podcast, write. Podcast, write. Same thing over and over again. The timing might move a little bit, but there's a rhythm to it. And so it just becomes part of what I do. So I try to have habits for that kind of stuff. I use a lot of uh, automation where I can, where it's safe and it makes sense with certain kinds of things in my in my business. That I, I mean, Zapier, I, I don't know what I would do without Zapier. I would need to hire somebody without Zapier to like manage my calendar and all this kind of stuff. So I try to use those kinds of tools to offload as much of that stuff as I can. But yeah, it's 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 probably hard and it's hard to keep the velocity up with this many balls in the air all the time. But I think being organized and having sets of time where I block out work time, that's that's something I do is block the calendar out for certain kinds of work. Um, and yeah, just kind of learning how to tune the schedule right and, and making sure I'm saying no to the right things is a big part of it too. And I mean, I think that's something data teams also need to be doing is like, are we working on the right projects? And what do we say no to here? And what's the risk level if we get this wrong? And I think part of that is not just a you deciding, but it's you working with the customers and clients. And again, I'm, I'm talking most to, mostly to the enterprise data teams at this point. Um, I think learning how to say no as a, in a way that's kind of a gift, which is it's no because we're not going to deliver on this. Yes, we can build a dashboard, but can we build a tool that's going to help you make decisions about price forecasting? Not in, not in three months. So yeah, the dashboard's easy, but not the decision making you want to do with the dashboard. That part's hard. So do you want a crappy dashboard or do you want help making decisions? Like, which is it? And really you want the decision making help. That's what you want. That's a nine month project. And so we're going to say no right now. You know, this is a gift and it has to be framed that way, you know? Exactly. I like that framing. It's, it's very positive and focuses on the other person, right? Focuses yeah. on them and their, yeah. their desired outcomes. Yeah. All right. So we're close to the end. Um, I would like to ask a few last questions. So sure. first of all, yeah. What are you working on at the moment? What, what is something you would like to share about your work right now? Oh, what am I working on? So right now, I've, again, I think I mentioned this earlier, I'm, I'm trying to start this uh, uh, data product leadership community. So th the idea here is that I think product, the idea of product is a different framing. It, it comes out of the software world. It's not present in the enterprise uh, data science and analytics community a lot. And I think the framing of thinking about products and for, and I'll tell you what I, what I, when I say that, what do I mean? It means two things. Products almost implies someone's going to buy something and use it and they're paying money. They're handing over money because the value is there. So even if customers don't pay you to use your Tableau dashboards or your internal application that you wrote or your shiny app or whatever it is, how good could it be or would it have to be to get that people would actually pay to use it? What if we had that mindset that like, this has to generate revenue for the data science team or else it fails. Literally like someone has to pay us a license, you know, monthly seat fee. What if we approach the work like that? How good would it be? What would we do differently? That's the first part. And the second part is that products, unlike projects, don't end. Like products are on a continuum. And projects kind of usually have an endpoint to them. And I'm not saying that every project that you do can go on indefinitely. But if we think about it as products and shipping small increments of work and something that someone, again, might be willing to pay for, it's a different way of approaching the work. And it suggests that like this MVP mentality, which is minimum viable product, which I actually like minimum valuable product, this kind of approach to small change, learning quickly, reacting to feedback and evolving it over time. And when they say this is awesome or yeah, it's good, but like we spent a lot of time with this tool. Could you make it easier or could you bring this other thing? And yeah, we can do another iteration and make that better. It's this product mentality. And so for people who think this way, and maybe you don't have it all figured it out, but you feel like that's the right kind of approach to this, to starting to make a difference in the work that data science and analytics can do, that's what it's for. It's for people that are leading teams that do that kind of thing. So the community is on, is on my plate as well as, um, you know, I teach a, a training seminar called Designing Human-Centered Data Products, largely for non-designers, so data science leaders, analytics leaders. And um, I have an opportunity to do that at the TDWI conference in Munich coming up in June. But I need to squeeze that down into a half-day format from my current eight-week format. 
So that's my other project is, uh, and this actually gets into this idea of, of, of subtractive design. And you were talking about this uh, earlier and I meant to mention it, but one of the great things that approaches to design is like not just the pencil, but the eraser. Like what could we take away? How can we reduce and remove to make something uh, easier, more useful? Could we take data out that's actually creating noise or creating friction? or it's evidence that's being shown at the wrong time and it's it's changing the story that we really want to tell. So the eraser is also one of the key tools of design. So I'm in the middle of starting to erase part of my seminar and, and bring it down into a half day in-person format, which is also new for me. I've never actually given this training before in person. It's always been digital because uh, I do, I, I'll do remote work. Uh, my whole business is, is remote. So I'm looking forward to jumping in and hoping that, hoping the Germans are up for a, a gringo from Boston to come in and uh, <laughs> awesome. uh, work with me. So, yeah. Yeah. I'm curious what your experience will be like being, uh, being in person again. And, um, I can't yeah, wait. sounds, yeah, uh, yeah. sounds, sounds like a, a lot of different, exciting, uh, things you're working on. Sure. So what, what, what is, what is one big takeaway you want listeners to take away from this episode today? Yeah. Well, there's two, first of all, it's outcomes, not outputs that matter. And that's not my framing. There's a book on that. I haven't read and I forget the author's name, but you got to remember that really the, the impact of the work comes from the outcomes of the work, not the outputs. So that framing is so critical. And if you don't understand that, I bet if you stand back and look at your projects, you're going to see that, yes, we built this model, but nobody used it. So technically for a conference, yeah, it's, it's worth writing a white paper about. Did it make a difference? No, because it didn't create an outcome. First, that's the first one. And the second one is that you can't get to bit like this whole data community. I'm going to rant here for a second. Oh, business value and insights and all this kind of crap. I hear this. I've been hearing this for since I got into this field. And what I what I rarely hear spoken about is that how do you get to business value, which assumes some human beings made some changes and it created some kind of impact on revenue or costs or some business metric. How do you do that if those people never interact with the solution that was built, the data tool, the widget, the application, the model, the whatever it is, if they're not using it, how can you possibly get to business value? So you can't, you can't just jump from data to business value and skip over the human adoption piece. So let's target the adoption piece and the utility and the usability piece at the point at which it, it, it becomes, it has a chance of becoming business value. I don't know how you do that unless you're talking about fully automated systems, which still have some human beings involved, but most of us are not working on completely automated AI systems. And that's, if you are great, and if you don't need humans, great. And if everyone's happy, that, that, that's nice, but I don't think that's the majority. So you have to think about this. If you ever want to get to business value, I don't know how you do it, uh, consistently at least. You might get lucky. Some of the projects might be easy and that's fine, but consistently doing it, you got to think about that. Absolutely. Absolutely. I completely agree, Brian. Yeah. Thanks so much for, um, for being here today. I, I also want to ask you about where people can connect with you or follow you. I I've been part of your newsletter for maybe two years by now. Okay. So, um, Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So you, people can sign up via your website. Where yeah. can people follow you or connect with you? Sure, sure. Yeah, the my website is designingforanalytics.com. So yeah, I have a mailing an insights mailing list there. And I'll also if you join the list, you'll get updates on my podcast, which is called Experiencing Data. So if you don't want to join the list, but you want to listen to the show, it's on all the major platforms, just type in Experiencing Data. Uh, best place to probably connect with me is LinkedIn. That's that's where I'm most active. Uh, I am Rhythm Spice on Twitter. I'm not super active on Twitter. But if you like that, feel free to, to connect with me there. <clears throat> Fantastic. Yeah. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks so much, Brian. Um, for me, it was very exciting to talk today with yeah. a fellow human being who really cares about the human in the loop and uh, yeah, and yeah. making it work. Right. Um, a few things that stood out for me was the not the pencil but the eraser. I'm gonna keep that in yeah. mind. I think it's a it's it's a great quote, yeah. and I think it applies yeah. to to many situations. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so thank you for uh, for doing your work and for being here today and spreading yeah. your insights. Yeah. By the way, Gilbert, can I just tell you one thing about subtractive design? A great, sure. and I just heard this example and it's like my favorite example. So if you ever taught a little kid how to ride a bike before, if you, if you notice the, the, the new bikes that you buy, 
for little kids don't have pedals. Because what was the problem with riding the bike? It's not the balance, it's the pedals. It's moving the legs and keeping the feet on the pedals. So what did they do? They removed something. They didn't add training wheels to the bike. They took the pedals away to get the kid comfortable with the, learning the balance piece first. And then you go in and you add the pedals later. And that's a great example of taking something away to make it better. So anyway, I just wanted to leave your audience with that. What could you take away? <laughs> awesome example. Yeah. yeah, maybe in a few years I will get kids or try it out with your own kid. Yeah. Uh, and I'm curious <laughs> to see how it's going to work out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Cool. Thanks so much, Brian. All right. Thanks for joining today and uh, we'll speak soon. Take care. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Do you want people to listen to your data and increase your business impact? Then take my free email course or do the quick self-test of your data communication skills. Go to mindspeaking.com and start learning today.